Welcome everyone um, to the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. I'm Professor Michael Rosenthal. I teach in the philosophy department and in, uh, in CJS. And I'm really delighted to welcome you today uh, to the Raws and Ralph Halbert Lecture in Jewish Studies. Uh, before I begin and before I introduce the speaker, um, I want to read the University of Toronto land acknowledgement. Uh, we wish to acknowledge that this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be able to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Karine Nissenbaum is the Rene Crown Professor in the Humanities and the Assistant Professor of Philosophy um, at Syracuse University, where she's also affiliated with the Jewish Studies Program. She's taught at Boston College, Colgate University, and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her research focuses on topics at the intersection of metaphysics and ethics, in Kant, post-Kantian German idealism, and 19th and 20th century uh, Jewish thought. Her book, For the Love of Metaphysics, Nihilism, and the Conflicts of Reason from Kant to Rosenzweig, was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. She's also published several articles in venues such as the Journal of the History of Philosophy and the European Journal of Philosophy. And currently she's working on a monograph on moral perfectionism and the highest good in Kant and post-Kantian German idealism. Um, today, the title of her talk is Getting to the Root of Evil, Kant and Fichte on the Murderer at the Door. Intriguing <laughs> title, and I'm really looking forward to our talk. You should know that there is a handout for this talk, and it's available if you go to the chat. Uh, if you click on the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom, uh, console here or screen, you can click on the chat and you'll see that there is um, a PDF handout, um, which uh, Professor Nissenbaum will use um, during her talk. So I would highly recommend that you download it. Uh, you can click on it, download it, then you can, I think you have to click first, then it will download and you can put it, uh, open it on your screen. Um, and uh, without any further ado, let me turn things over to, uh, so at the end of the talk, which will be about 50 minutes, then we'll have a chance for plenty of discussion. So as you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, write them uh, in the Q&A section uh, of our Zoom. And then I will choose some of them um, with Professor Nissenbaum to answer during uh, uh, the Q&A at the end of the talk. So. Without any further ado, let me turn things over to Professor Nissenbaum. Welcome and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, um, for that introduction. Um, I also want to thank um, the Antennenbaum Center for Jewish Studies um, and the philosophy department for the invitation to give this talk, which has special significance for me um, because I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto. So I'm especially sorry that I can't be there um, in person with you. Um, but we wanted to avoid exposing you to COVID because I had COVID last week. Um, okay, so as Michael mentioned, there's a handout. Um, it's fairly detailed for um, people who are um, new to this material. Um, and I'll um, just start the talk. Kant's formula of humanity commands us to act in such a way that we always use humanity, whether in our own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. This version of the categorical imp imperative expresses a widespread intuition that our rational nature gives us a special unconditional value and shows that we have a dignity above all price. Respect is a moral attitude that all persons are entitled to in virtue of this unconditional value of the rational nature. Some of Kant's interpreters have argued that the idea that all human beings merit respect in virtue of their capacity for rational agency can help us understand the motivation for his uncompromising defense of the duty to be truthful in his famous essay on a supposed right to lie from philanthropy. 
Where Kant claims that one is not allowed to lie, not even if a murderer comes to one's door asking the, the whereabouts of their innocent victim who has taken refuge in one's home. Yet to many of Kant's readers, this obviously seems like the wrong conclusion, in part because it seems to imply that our moral obligations leave us powerless in the face of evil. Or worse, our good actions end up being instrumentalized for evil purposes and were turned into tools of evil. In light of this apparent problem for the Kantian position, I will reconstruct and defend a Fichtian approach to the duty of truthfulness. I will argue that Fichte's prohibition against lying ultimately aims to get at the root of evil. Fichte presents his take on the case of the murder at the door in his system of ethics, a little later than and independently of Kant's essay. And like Kant, he concludes that we should not lie to an evildoer. As I will explain, Fichte's rigorism concerning our obligation to tell the truth follows from his perfectionism. By perfectionism, I mean a moral theory according to which a person's good consists in the perfection or full realization of her essential nature and capacities. On Fichte's view, I'm not allowed to lie to an evildoer because I have a duty to summon them to perfect their humanity by making choices that are fully rational. Earlier, I said that Kant's formula of humanity expresses a widespread commitment to the view that all persons are entitled to respect in virtue of the unconditional value of their rational nature. But the Fichtian view goes beyond the Kantian commitment to respect all human beings. It enables us to defend the view that human beings deserve equal respect in virtue of their potential for per perfected rationality. This capacity constrains how we can interact with them by compelling us to recognize and promote their capacity to set themselves a moral end and to enter into the moral community. I will call this Fichtian view that we have an obligation to help others perfect their humanity by making choices that are fully rational, the perfectionist commitment. As I mentioned earlier, I will also argue that far from leaving us powerless in the face of evil, Fichte's uncompromising defense of the duty of truthfulness aims to get at the root of evil. As we shall see, on Fichte's view, evil is a product of acting without sufficient reflection and never attaining adequate consciousness of one's duty in a particular situation. So if I'm confronted with evil, it's my duty to set an example for the evildoer and to summon them to embark on the path of self-conscious reflection a path that Fichte believes leads to moral goodness and to moral maturity. I will focus primarily on Fichte's views on the duty of truthfulness in his system of ethics. Towards the end of the talk, I will briefly consider Fichte's remarks on truth and lies in his essay on the basis of our belief in the divine governance of the world, where Fichte suggests that belief in a providentially ordered world at least partly consists in the belief that life will place us in situations where we will have the opportunity to be summoned to perfect our own rational nature, and where we will have opportunity to summon others to perfect their rational nature. In this way, we all contribute to the realization of the final moral end, which Fichte conceives as a state of affairs in which all rational beings will have perfected their freedom. I conclude by considering whether Fichte's uncompromising defense of the duty to be truthful and his related view that good can never come from evil can seem persuasive if we do not believe in a providential order. To this end, I draw a comparison between Fichte's view that evil is a product of acting without sufficient reflection and Hannah Arendt's view concerning the interconnection between the ability or inability to think and evil. Okay, so I turn to part one of the paper where I discuss the ethical and juridical approaches to Kant's prohibition on, on lying. So it's a point of dispute how exactly the formula of humanity and the unconditional value of our rational nature can be seen to motivate Kant's prohibition against lying to the murderer at the door. One approach adopts an ethical perspective of Kant's prohibition against lying, and a second approach adopts a political or juridical perspective. Before turning to Fichte's approach, I will first explain these two different takes on Kant's prohibition against lying. I will focus on the juridical perspective, which relies on the view that a lie wrongs humanity generally by bringing about the dissolution of the rightful condition into the violence of the state of nature. 
While this approach has received less attention, it has the interpretive advantage of more faithfully representing the motivation for Kant's views. But as I will argue, it still makes it difficult to defend Kant's conclusion that it's wrong to lie to an evildoer, such as a murderer at the door. This is because Kant seems insufficiently concerned with preventing the murderer from bringing about the dissolution of the rightful condition. And once again, it seems that his rigorism concerning our duty to be truthful leaves us powerless in the face of evil. So Christine Korsgaard and Honor O'Neill claim that Kant's prohibition against lying follows from his moral philosophy and more specifically from the formula of humanity in the following way. Humanity or rational nature is a capacity to set ends and to determine oneself to act by the representation of those ends. For moral theories based on the value of humanity or rational nature, deception is one of the most serious forms of wrongdoing to another person. This is because if I mislead you and cause you to believe something that is not true, I interfere with your capacity to think for yourself and to make your own decisions. If I cause you to act based on false information, I co-opt your agency by putting your actions in the service of an end you did not consent to further. For this reason, I'm not allowed to lie, not even to save a friend from a murderer. Korsgaard attempts to defend Kant's puzzling conclusion by drawing a distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory, and by arguing that the formula of humanity upholds an ideal of human relations that it is sometimes impossible to realize. Under non-ideal conditions, when the attempt to act in accordance with the moral law would turn us into a tool of evil, we may and perhaps even must depart from the ideal, for example, by lying to the murderer at the door. Korsgaard's misgivings are symptomatic of the widespread view that the, that the Kantian position is obviously wrong and needs to be fixed. Another problem with her approach to Kant's prohibition against lying is that Kant never discusses lying as a violation of a duty to another individual. Lying is either a violation of a duty of right that wrongs no particular person, or it's a violation of a perfect ethical duty to oneself. In a supposed right to lie from philanthropy, Kant makes it clear that he is approaching the topic from a political or juridical perspective and not from an ethical perspective, and that he considers lying as a violation of a duty of right that wrongs no particular person, but only humanity in general. And in the doctrine of virtue, he discusses lying as a violation of a human being's duty to himself as a moral being. In recent decades, some of Kant's readers have noted this fact and used Kant's doctrine of right to explain why his puzzling conclusion about the wrongfulness of lying to the murderer at the door follows from his political or juridical views. And here I'm drawing on work by scholars such as Jacob Weinrib, Helga Varden, and Alan Wood. So in order to show that Kant's conclusion about the wrongfulness of lying to the murderer at the door follows from his political or juridical views, I first need to explain why Kant believes we have an obligation to leave the state of nature and enter into a rightful condition by establishing and respecting a powerful and authoritative government. Kant defends this view in the doctrine of right, the first half of the metaphysics of morals. His argument is based on the view that each individual has an innate right to external freedom, which he defines as independence from being constrained by another's choice. If we keep in mind what Kant means by humanity, namely the capacity to set and pursue ends, it isn't difficult to see that this right to equal external freedom is grounded in the value of humanity. Each person is entitled to an equal space for self-directed action in virtue of their humanity or rational nature. But Kant holds that it's only possible to respect everyone's right to external freedom under the rule of law. This is because each person's innate right to external freedom entitles her to private rights, such as rights to her body and to property. But in the state of nature, where there's no common authority and no impartial decision-making procedure for settling disputes of over rights, no individual has a power to establish, determine the boundaries of, or enforce those rights. So in the state of nature, our private rights are only provisional. 
For this reason, private rights require public rights, the rights of the people consider as a, as a joint aggregate or general will. And when people act jointly in this way, they act as a state. Only the state has a right to define the scope of our rights and to enforce those rights. So to summarize, given that we're obligated to respect each person's innate right to external freedom, and given that we can do so only in a state, Kant thinks that we are obligated to submit to the authority of the state if we have one and to establish one if we do not. Okay, so now we're prepared to see how in the in this supposed right to lie essay, Kant argues that a lie wrongs humanity in general by bringing about the dissolution of the rightful condition, the condition that is required to protect everyone's external right to freedom. In the essay, Kant is responding to an earlier piece by the French philosopher Benjamin Constant, who attributes to Kant the view that it would be a crime to tell a lie to a murderer who asked whether our friend who was being pursued by the murderer had taken refuge in our house. In response to the question whether a person in this situation has the authorization, the right, to be untruthful, Kant says, truthfulness in statements that cannot be avoided is a formal duty of man to everyone, however great the disadvantage that may arise or from for, for him or for any other. For a lie always harms another, if not some other human being, then it nevertheless does harm humanity in general inasmuch as it vici vitiates the very source of right. Both in the essay on lying and in the doctrine of right, Penn contrasts a formal wrong with a material wrong or an injustice against some individual person. A formal wrong is a violation of the postulate of public right, um, which is as follows. When you cannot avoid living side by side with all others, you ought to leave the state of nature and proceed with them into a rightful condition. This violation of the postulate of public right does not tra transgress the right of humanity in the murderer's person, as Korsgaard argues, but it does violate the right of humanity generally. This makes it clear that on Kant's view, lying is not a violation of a duty to another individual, but a violation against the rights of humanity generally. As we have seen, this is because it's only possible to respect everyone's right to external freedom under the rule of law, and Kant here argues that a lie vitiates the source of right. But how exactly does a lie bring about the dissolution of the rightful condition? As I mentioned earlier, public rights are the rights of the people considered as a joint agent or general will. When people act jointly, they act as a state. It follows that the source of right is the general united will of the people and that this is what characterizes the rightful condition. In the doctrine of right, Kant makes this clear when he says that all right is to proceed from the legislative authority that can belong only to the united will of the people, only the concurring and united will of all, insofar as each decides the same thing for all and all for each can be legislative. But if I lie to you, we cannot share a common deliberative standpoint and act with a united will. As Jacob Weinrib explains this point, Deception is incompatible with the united will and with the rights that proceed from the united will, because the will cannot be united if the parties within the will are entitled to deceive each other by expressing one thing and meaning another. If I deceive you, we can't make choices that are ours. We can also see how a lie brings about the, the dissolution of the rightful condition if we consider right as a practice that is governed by different rules including the rule of truthfulness. Drawing on Ron Rawls' conception of a practice, Alan Wood clarifies the point as follows. For Kant, right is a practice, the rational practice involving what is necessary to guarantee people rightful freedom under universal law. Truthfulness in making declarations is one of the rules of the practice. Now, practices cannot exist if the rules are universally violated but they can exist if the rules are violated sometimes. So how could a single lie to a wrongdoer, to the murderer at the door, vitiate the source of right, the general united will of the people? Kant must think that if the homeowner lied, he would take it to be the case that there's a reason to lie to the murderer and reasons are derived from general rules or principles. So in order to be rational, the homeowner's decision to lie would need to be based on a general or universal principle, 
to the effect that lying to a wrongdoer is permissible. But this universal principle would undermine the practice of right, because truthfulness is one of the rules of the practice. With this interpretation of Kant's view that a lie vitiates the source of right in hand, we can revisit the scenario of the murder at the door and consider whether Kant's conclusion that we should not lie to the murderer seems the right conclusion. If I were there in person, I would ask to see a show of hands <laughs> who believes that this is the right conclusion, but I can't see you, so. Okay, so one reason why we might think Kant's conclusion that we should not lie to the murderer is still the wrong conclusion is that Kant seems unconcerned with the fact that the murderer is adopting an end that is obviously at odds with the source of right, the general united will of the people. The content of the murderer's intention makes it clear that he is willing to bring about the dissolution of the rightful condition by violating others' innate right to external freedom. Perhaps Kant would say that only the state has a right to enforce everyone's rights, and we cannot take the law into our own hands. But once again, our good actions end up being instrumentalized for evil purposes, and we're turned into tools of evil. Okay. I turn now to the second part of the paper. Well, I will explain and defend Fichte's approach to the prohibition against lying. As I mentioned earlier, I will argue that Fichte's approach can be characterized as perfectionist and has as its aim to get at the root of evil. Let me begin by noting an important difference between Kant's and Fichte's views concerning what is involved in treating our own and every other human being's capacity for the rational choice of ends as an end in itself. This is what the formula of humanity commands us to do. Kant says that rational nature must not be thought of as an end to be affected, but as an independently existing end, and hence thought only negatively, that is, as that which must never be acted against and which must therefore, in every volition, be estimated never merely as a means, but always at the same time as an end. This passage suggests that humanity, or rational nature, is not on Kant's view something that we are to realize or bring into existence. It's already an independently existing end. As Korsgaard notes, this means that the end of rational nature functions in our de deliberations negatively as something that is not to be acted against. Rational nature is thus a limiting condition of the rationality of choice and action. By contrast, the fundamental orientation of Fichte's normative ethics is teleological. In the system of ethics, Fichte says that the end or aim of moral action is to realize a state of affairs where reason and reason alone should have dominion in the sensible world. Fichte also puts this point by saying that the end of the morally good person is that reason and morality should have dominion within the community of rational beings. The point of saying that not just reason, but also morality should have dominion in the sensible world is to stress that the aim of our moral action is not just right action or legality, but right action done out of love for the good. So on Fichte's view, treating humanity as an end means striving to realize a state of affairs where all human beings will have perfected the rational nature by acting from duty or out of love for the good. Sorry, just see my nose. The idea that our moral aim is not just legality, but morality, or right action done out of love for the good, leads to the idea that our moral goal is the formal freedom of all rational beings. For as Fichte says, no action is moral that does not occur with freedom. This is because moral action requires a form of self-conscious and reflective affirmation of the goodness of the action I'm about to perform. And this in turn requires the capacity to step back from the, all the impulses that affect me, to be aware of different lines of action and evaluate various possibilities, and to choose one of them and determine myself by forming a concept of the end I wish to realize. Formal freedom is thus a tendency or disposition to form intentions spontaneously based on the concept of ends. It's a form of self-determination through concepts or through thinking. As Michelle Koch rightly notes, this is a form of freedom of the will that is required for an agent to be morally responsible 
and an appropriate addressee of moral imperatives. And on Fichte's view, formal freedom comes in degrees. One perfects one's freedom first by setting oneself ends in general, then by, by setting oneself the moral end, and ultimately by limiting one's freedom through the concept of the other's freedom and positing oneself as standing in a relation of right with others. More could be said about Fichte's notion of formal freedom and how it relates to other conceptions of freedom in the system of ethics, such as material freedom. More could, could also be said about how formal freedom relates to Kantian conceptions of freedom, such as negative freedom, practical freedom, transcendental freedom, or autonomy. For our purposes, what matters is the idea that formal freedom is a form of freedom required for moral agency and for moral responsibility, and that this form of freedom requires having a multiplicity of action possibilities and determining oneself to act based, based on self-conscious evaluative reflection. As I will argue, on Fichte's view, the murderer at the door does not yet fully, fully possess this form of freedom. What he says about how we should interact with this individual suggests that he believes it's our moral duty to model what this form of freedom looks like with the expectation that this will enable them to exercise their own formal freedom. Moreover, because Fichte, Fichte thinks that evil is a product of insufficient reflection, he also believes that the murderer will abandon their evil intention if they accept our summons to engage in self-conscious reflection. So first, we need to see how Fichte derives the duty of truthfulness from our duty to promote the formal freedom of all rational beings. Fichte explains that the formal freedom of an individual involves two elements. First, the continuous reciprocal interaction between their body and the sensible world. And second, that this interaction be determined only through the individual's freely designed concept concerning the character of this reciprocal interaction. So the first element of formal freedom results in a set of negative and positive duties concerning the cultivation and preservation of the body. For example, I should never exercise any immediate influence over the body of another, and I may not seek to move the other person's will by constraint, beatings, hunger, withdrawal of freedom, or imprisonment. The prohibition against murder and suicide are derived from this duty to cultivate and preserve the body. Considered positively, our duty is to promote the health, strength, and preservation of the other's body and life. The second element of formal freedom results in a set of duties to preserve and promote every individual's free influence upon the sensible world mediated by their own intellect. So an individual's efficacious action is supposed to produce what he is thinking of when he acts. So if they possess inaccurate or false information, this will interfere with their ability to carry out their intentions and to influence the sensible world. Thus, if I'm to promote the free causality of my fellow human beings, I must not lie to them or deceive them, whether by asserting something that I do not consider to be true or by providing information intended to deceive them. My positive duty is to promote correct insight on the part of others and actually to communicate to them any truth we ourselves might know. So I should disclose any information that I'm aware of that might be of practical relevance to other individuals. And if I see that another human being is engaged in some action, and if I have reason to think that they have an incorrect view of the relevant circumstances, it's my duty to correct their error, for otherwise they might do something that is contrary to their own end. So now that we have seen how Fichte derives the duty of truthfulness from our duty to promote the formal freedom of others, and now that we have seen how this duty relates to Fichte's more general theory of value, the value of rational nature, we are prepared to examine Fichte's uncompromising defense of the duty of truthfulness and his take on the famous example of the murder at the door. I will begin by discussing what he says about these issues in the system of ethics, and then I'll turn to his comments on the duty of truthfulness in his essay on the basis of our belief in a divine governance of the world. Fichte presents the scenario as follows. A human being who is being persecuted by an enemy with a drawn sword hides himself in your presence. His enemy arrives and asks you where he is. If you tell the truth, then an innocent person will be murdered. Hence, some would argue you would have to lie in such a case. 
Before presenting his own proposal concerning how to approach the situation, which we will discuss in a moment, Fichte argues that philosophers who judge that lying is the only way to save the victim's life believe this, not because they're interested in saving the innocent victim, but because they fear for their own life. Because they fear for their own safety, they don't realize that instead of lying, they could also tell the murderer that they do not owe him an answer, that he seems to harbor some quite evil intention, that they advise him to abandon his intention of his own free will, and that otherwise they will take up the cause of the persecuted party and will defend him at the risk of their own life, which is in any case their own absolute obligation. This would be, Fichte thinks, the courageous approach to the situation, which would not require lying and would display a genuine interest in saving the victim, even if that, that might also risk turning the wrath of the murderer against them. So two things are worth noting about this first part of Fichte's take on the situation. First, it draws attention to Fichte's view that there's no self-other asymmetry. On Fichte's view, the moral standpoint is completely impartial. So once I have adopted this standpoint, I should realize that I should not let concern for my own safety prevent me from doing all that I can to protect an innocent victim. On Fichte's view, my own life and the life of the victim have equal value. This is because both we are both tools for the final agent neutral end of perfecting rational nature so that morality might have dominion over the sensible world. As Fichte says, I absolutely ought to preserve my own life as a tool of the moral law. For the same reason, I also ought to preserve the life of the other person, which we are here assuming to be in danger. The moral law commands each of these things unconditionally. Second, by examining the motivation of the philosopher who judges that lying is permissible in this situation, and by claiming that they're not motivated by genuine interest in saving the victim's life, but by fear for their own safety, it might seem that Fichte is suggesting that lying is not permissible only in the case of deceit for partial self-interest. But perhaps it is permissible in a case of deceit for the impartial end of say, saving any human life. So in other words, it might seem that Fichte is here suggesting that it's only with respect to the interest of personal advantage that the duty of truthfulness is absolute. But the duty of truthfulness might not be absolute when it comes into conflict with other duties, such as the duty to promote the health, strength, and preservation of any person's body and life. If so, then I would need to sort out this conflict of duties, perhaps by considering the relative importance of each duty for fulfilling the final moral end. Yet it's clear that Fichte believes there is no such conflict of duties in the case of the murder at the door. In fact, Fichte suggests that the appearance of a conflict of duties between the duty of truthfulness and the duty to preserve another person's body and life only arises in the situation because of what is at the root of all evil, namely deliberative laziness. This form of deliberative laziness is on Fichte's view what leads us to fail to recognize what morality demands. As he says, if one constantly reflects upon the demand of the law, if this demand always remains before one's eyes, then it is impossible not to act in accordance with this demand or to resist it. If the law disappears from our attention, however, then it is impossible for us, for us to act in accordance with it. So the philosopher who judges that lying is permissible in this situation arrives at this belief because their concern for their own safety obscures the course of action that is demanded by the moral law, which would require more effort. It's easier to get someone to do the right thing by by bypassing their will and lying to them than it is to get it to do them because they have come per to perceive it as the right thing to do. But as we have seen, our duty is not just legality, but morality or right action done out of love for the good. Such philosophers might not be conscious that their tendency to laziness is leading them to obscure the demand of the moral law and to believe that lying is permissible. So Fichte's task as philosopher is to summon other philosophers out of their deliberative laziness so that it won't affect their theorizing and lead them to conclude that lying is permissible. Philosophers who have overcome their own laziness or inertia will see the course of action that is demanded by the moral law 
a form of action that requires courage and more effort. By the way, the language of laziness or inertia is Fichte is not mine. So <laughs> um, if it sounds a bit harsh, that's coming from Fichte. Um, if the murderer at the door asks us whether his innocent victim is hiding in our presence, instead of telling the truth or a lie, we should try to get him to abandon his evil intention. This is how Fichte proposes to approach the murder at the door. So I'll read these two um, somewhat long passages. If you tell the truth, then an innocent person will be murdered. Hence, some would argue, you would have to lie in such a case. How do those who engage in such rash reasoning move so quickly over and beyond the many possibilities that lie before them on the straight path and switch to the crooked one? First of all, why should you tell the person who asks you where the other is hiding, either the truth or a lie? Why not tell him some third thing, something that lies in the middle, namely that you do not owe him an answer, that he seems to harbor some quite evil intention. They do, you advise him to abandon this intention of his own free will. You reply that if you were to do this, then he would turn his wrath against you. But why, I ask you, do you consider only this single possibility? Inasmuch as among all the things that are possible in this case, there's also a second possibility, namely that the opponent will be, will be so startled by your just and audacious resistance that he will desist from persecuting his enemy and will become calmer and open to negotiations. And the second passage. The same reasons apply against anyone who might, seek, who might seek to excuse a lie by saying that he told it because he thereby wanted to prevent some wrongdoing. He ought to hate the wrongdoing and to prevent it because it is immoral and by no means for the sake of the action as such. He can tell the truth to someone who asks him for it with an evil intent. But if he is aware of the other person's evil intent, then he ought to remonstrate with him and seek to convince him of the blameworthiness of his intentions. Sorry, I'm just gonna move these. Okay. The course of action that Fichte proposes in each of these passages is somewhat different, but in both cases, the aim is to get to what Fichte considers to be at the root of evil. Again, the failure to act with sufficient reflection. Fichte suggests that if the murderer were to step back and reflect on what he is about to do, if he were to act with sufficient formal freedom, he would recognize the blameworthiness of his intention and see that there are other possible courses of action open to him, courses of action that would enable him to become a tool of morality. In both passages, Fichte suggests that if we set an example and model what self-conscious free reflective moral action looks like, that might enable the murderer to realize that they're capable of acting in a similar fashion. So in other words, I read these two passages as examples of what Fichte in the Foundations of Natural Right calls a summons to free self-activity or upbringing. In the Foundations, Fichte argues that the summons interaction is the origin of both reflective self-consciousness and the disposition to form second order evaluative attitudes, and so to impose, impose normative demands of any kind upon oneself. A summons involves a demand to exercise one's free efficacy in a way that does not interfere with a summoner's own free efficacy. And this demand must be issued in a way that does not interfere with the free efficacy of the summon. It must not involve force. Much has been written about why Fichte regards the summons as a condition of reflective self-consciousness. My aim here is to draw attention to the role the summons plays in Fichte's defense of the duty of truthfulness and his take on the murder at the door. So let us examine more closely how Fichte proposes that we interact with the murder at the door. What form of action does Fichte invite us to model? Above all, he invites us to model loving optimism about other agents' capacity for moral improvement and to display our recognition of our duty to promote such improvement so that we might all serve as tools of morality. We have seen that on Fichte's view, our moral goal is a perfection of the formal freedom of all rational beings. Exercising this form of freedom well is what constitutes moral improvement and promoting this form of freedom is always our duty even when we're interacting with our enemies. As Fichte says, I should view my fellow human beings only as tools of the moral law. 
Even if a person is not now a tool of the moral law, I'm never permitted to give up hope that he will be able to become such a tool. This also holds in the case of my enemy. I ought to love him. In other words, I ought to believe him to be capable of improvement. And I ought to demonstrate this love through my deeds. I ought to work as much as I can towards his, his improvement. By modeling truthfulness and interest in the moral improvement of the evildoer, as we have seen, instead of lying, victim proposes that we advise a murderer to abandon their evil intention of their own free will, we invite them to enter into a shared practical standpoint and to join the moral community, conceived as a realm of joint participation in a shared activity oriented by a final moral end, the end of perfecting rationality. To see how we do this, let me introduce a helpful distinction between two conceptions of the nature of deception and two conceptions of the nature of truthfulness as the opposite of deception. Tamar Shapiro draws this distinction in her essay, Kantian Rigorism and Mitigating Circumstances. As she explains, these two different conceptions of the nature of deception presuppose more or less robust conceptions of the form of reciprocity that a moral community requires. On the view of deception that Shapiro calls deception as interference, it's the nature of deception to be a way of interfering with another's autonomy. And correlatively, it's the nature of honesty to be a way of acknowledging by not interfering with that autonomy. By conceiving the nature of deception as a form of interference, we focus on the fact that an act of deception prevents the other person from making their own choices. But as Shapiro rightly notes, by preventing you from making your own choices, I prevent us from making choices that count as ours, choices that stem from a shared practical standpoint. This suggests a more complete conception of deception, which he calls deception as refusal. On this view, deception, insofar as it interferes with another person's autonomy, amounts to a refusal to reciprocate within a scheme of shared thought and action. Importantly, Shapiro also notes that these two different views on the nature of deception presuppose more or less robust views on the sort of reciprocity that participating in a moral community involves. As she explains, deception as interference pre presupposes a conception of the moral community as an aggregate of self-governors bound by obligations of non-interference. By contrast, deception as refusal presupposes a conception of the moral community as a realm of joint participation in a shared activity. So when we model truthfulness, we model a form of action that is governed by the ideal of this sort of community. We can only model this form of action in the presence of the murderer because their own actions clearly are not yet governed by this ideal. Insofar as this ideal is an ideal of joint participation in a shared activity, when the actions of the person with whom I'm interacting are not also governed by the same ideal, my own side of the inter interaction can only simulate the form of reciprocity that the, the ideal presupposes. As Shapiro notes, I can only be truthful in an aspirational mode as an attempt to model and foster the kind of equal relationships that acts of honestly properly require as a, their constitutive background. So I'm truthful in this aspirational mode in the hope that the person with whom I'm interacting will observe my actions and discern, discern how they're governed by the ideal of joint participation in a moral community. If they come to appreciate the value of that ideal, that might lead them to adopt the, the ideal as their own. Perhaps they won't immediately adopt the ideal of joint participation in a moral community, but the interaction will plant a seed that might bear fruit in years to come. Now, let me briefly consider how Fichte would regard arguments for paternalistic deception and arguments for defensive deception. A classic ar argument for paternalistic deception, deception that is undertaken for the sake of the good of the person deceived, is that the person is not in a position to make choices that count as their own. This could be because a person is mentally ill or because their capacities have not developed to the stage where they're governed by reason rather than instinct. This argument, though, cannot be used in cases of defensive deception, deception undertaken to prevent another person's wrongdoing. And the case of the murder at the door seems to be a case of defensive deception. This is because in the case of defensive deception, the wrongdoer is presumably capable 
of governing themselves and making their own choices. They just make choices that are morally wrong. But Fichte would treat both cases in a similar fashion. As we have seen on Fichte's view, moral, morally wrong actions are explicable by failures of practical reflection. So if I'm confronted with evil, it's my duty to set an example for the evildoer and to summon them to embark on the path of self-conscious reflection, a path that as we have seen, Fichte believes leads to moral goodness and to moral maturity. So on Fichte's view, both paternalistic deception and defensive deception manifest pessimism concerning other agents' capacity for moral improvement or lack of interest in promoting this sort of improvement. Okay, so let me uh, summarize what I've argued so far. Fichte's rigorism concerning our obligation to tell the truth goes hand in hand with his perfectionism. By perfectionism, I mean a moral theory according to which a person's good consists in the perfection or full realization of her essential nature and capacities. As we have seen, Fichte derives the duty of truthfulness from our duty to promote the formal freedom of all rational beings. On Fichte's view, I'm not allowed to lie to you because I have a duty to help you perfect your humanity by making choices that are fully rational and in doing so to become a tool of morality. Drawing on Tamar Shapiro's essay on Kantian rigorism, I have also shown that Fichte's take on the duty of truthfulness is governed by a view of the form of reciprocity that a moral community requires that is more robust than the Kantian view, at least as it has traditionally been understood. On the Kantian or egalitarian model, the moral community is an aggregate of self-governors bound by obligations of non-interference. But on the Fichtean or perfectionist model, the moral community is a realm of joint participation in a shared activi activity governed by a final moral end. I have also argued that Fichte's views on a moral obligation to tell the truth do not leave us powerless in the face of evil. Instead, Fichte's aim is to get at the root of evil. On Fichte's view, evil is a product of acting without sufficient reflection and never attaining adequate consciousness of one's duty in a particular situation. For this reason, if I'm confronted with evil, it's my duty to summon the evildoer to embark on the path of self-conscious reflection, again, which leads to moral maturity and to moral goodness. Having discussed Fichte's take on the duty of truthfulness in the system of ethics, I will now briefly consider his remarks on truth and lies in his essay on the basis of our belief in a divine governance of the world. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, in this essay, Fichte suggests that believing that the sensible world is providentially governed means believing that life will place us in situations where we will be summoned to perfect our own rational nature and we, where we will summon others to perfect their rational nature. So if we're confronted with evil, we should keep this providential order in mind. We're not allowed to engage in defensive deception to prevent another person's wrongdoing, because doing so would involve shunning our duty to contribute towards a final moral end of perfecting our own rationality and that of others. As is well known on the basis of our belief in a divine governance of the world is the essay that led to the famous atheism controversy and to Fichte's dismissal from his position at Jena. In this essay, Fichte argues that religious belief amounts to nothing more than belief in a providential moral world order. The traditional belief that God is a particular being who causes this moral world order and is distinct both from individual human beings and the world is therefore superfluous. Fichte describes what true belief in a providential moral world order involves and it is in this context that he makes the following remarks about lying. Anyone willing to do what is evil in order to obtain good results is a godless person. In a morally governed world, good can never come from evil. And as surely as you believe in such a moral governance of the world, it is impossible for you to think that it could. You are not permitted to lie, even if the world should fall into, into ruin as a consequence of your refusal to do so. This, however, is no more than a figure of speech, for if you were able to believe in all seriousness that the world would crumble as a consequence of your refusal to lie, then at the very least your own nature would be utterly self-contradictory and self-destroying. But this is precisely what you do not believe, nor can you believe it, nor are you permitted to do so. You know that a lie is certainly not included within the plan of the world's preservation. 
So at first blush, Fichte's defense of the duty of truthfulness here seems quite different in spirit from his defense of the duty of truthfulness in the system of ethics. As I mentioned earlier in the system of ethics, Fichte says that the end or aim of moral action is to realize a state of affairs where reason and reason alone should have do dominion in the sensible world. This shows that the fundamental orientation of Fichte's normative ethics in the system of ethics is teleological. Fichte derives our duties to others by showing how they contribute to the realization of the final moral end, and he judges whether particular actions are morally correct or not based on whether they lie on the path that leads towards this final moral end. Deception is prohibited because it does not promote, but instead interferes with the rational, rational agent's formal freedom, with their disposition to form intentions spontaneously based on the concept of ends. But by contrast, in the Divine Governance essay, Fichte argues that deception is wrong, not because of the consequences it fails to bring about, but because it displays disbelief in a providential moral world order where good can never come from evil. Indeed, Fichte argues that true atheism, genuine unbelief and godlessness, consists in pettifogging over the consequences of one's actions, in refusing to hearken the voice of one's own conscience until one believes that one has first foreseen the success of the same. So in other words, while Fichte's defense of the duty of truthfulness in the system of ethics seems to lend support to the view that the fundamental orientation of Fichte's normative ethics is teleological, his defense of the duty of truthfulness in the divine governance essay seems to lend support to the view that the fundamental orientation of Fichte's normative ethics is deontological. Despite this apparent difference between the two arguments, might there be a way to reconcile them? I believe that the teleological orientation of Fichte's defense of the duty of truthfulness in the system of ethics is compatible with the deontological orientation of his argument in divine governance, but only if we take seriously the religious dimension of his thought. So let me explain. If we consider what belief in a providential moral world order involves, we will see that it fundamentally involves a belief that the world is ordered teleologically, such that different events, circumstances, actions, and agents will contribute towards an ideal end. Different conceptions of providence will result in different conceptions of the final end. Yet belief in a providential moral world order also involves a view that individual agents won't always be able to discern how particular events, circumstances, and actions do in fact contribute towards a final end. For this reason, individual agents are enjoined to focus on acting on principle or for the right reasons and liberated from the task of calculating the benefits to be achieved or the harms to be averted in doing so. This is because in a world that is providentially ordered, acting on principle should result in good consequences. In a world that's providentially ordered, there should be no conflict, but only harmony between good principles and good consequences. As Fichte says, in a morally governed world, good can never come from evil. And as surely as you believe in such a moral governance of the world, it's impossible for you to think that it could. So returning to the example of the murderer at the door, a person who believes that the world is providentially ordered can act on principle and not lie to the murderer because they trust that all events and circumstances contribute to the final moral end. A person who believes that the world is providentially ordered trusts that if they have the courage to confront the murderer and summon them to step back and reflect on what they're about to do, they might recognize the blameworthiness of their intention and see that there are other practical alternatives. For a person who believes in a providential moral world order, there's no conflict between teleological and deontological orientations. Thus, the fact that scholars are so divided between teleological and deontological readings of Fichte's normative ethics might say more about our own atheistic age than about any fundamental tension or inconsistency in Fichte's works. So I, just, I have just argued that Fichte's defense of the duty to be truthful and his view that we should not lie to the murderer at the door rely on the idea that in a morally governed world, good can never come from evil. If that is the case, can Fichte's uncompromising defense of the duty to be truthful persuade people who do not believe in a providential world order? If, as is often done, 
we replaced the murderer at the door with a Nazi officer looking for Jewish people hiding in others' homes during the Second World War. Fichte's views seem hopelessly naive. Could Fichte really mean to say that people hiding Jews in their homes should have told the truth to the Nazis in the hope that they would be so startled by our just and audacious resistance that they would desist from persecuting their enemy and would become calmer and open to negotiations? Even asking the question might seem ludicrous. But let me try to clarify why I believe Fichte's view is not hopelessly naive. As we have seen, the reason why Fichte believes that we should not lie to an evildoer is that he believes evil is a product of acting without sufficient reflection. If I'm confronted with evil, it's my duty to summon the evildoer to embark on the path of self-conscious reflection, again, a path that Fichte believes leads to moral goodness. This is because moral action requires a form of self-conscious and reflective affirmation of the goodness of the moral action I'm about to perform. This in turn requires a capacity to step back from the, all the impulses that affect me, to be aware of different lines of action, and to evaluate various possibilities, and to choose one of them by forming a concept of the end I wish to realize. Moral action thus requires formal freedom, the tendency or disposition to form intentions spontaneously based on the concept of ends. Moral action requires self-determination through concepts or through thinking. So on Fichte's view, the root of evil is a form of thoughtlessness. In 1961, Hannah Arendt witnessed the end of the trial of Adolf Eichmann, one of the major figures in the organization of the Holocaust. In her report on the trial, Arendt makes a similar point about an inner connection between evil and the ability or inability to think. Commenting on what it was like to listen to Eichmann, she writes, the longer one listened to Eichmann, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was closely connected with an inability to think. After the trial, Arendt became increasingly preoccupied with the question of the relationship between thinking and evil. She explicitly addressed this issue in an essay published in 1971, Thinking and Moral Considerations, which was later integrated into the life of the mind. Eichmann's total absence of thinking attracted her interest and led her to ask the following questions. Is our ability to judge, to tell right from wrong, beautiful from ugly, dependent upon our faculty of thought, Though the inability to think and a disastrous failure of what we commonly call conscience coincide. Could the activity of thinking as such, the habit of examining and reflecting upon whatever happens to come to pass, regardless of specific content and quite independent of results, could this activity be of such a nature that it conditions men against evil doing? For rent, thinking is a specific sort of rational activity a silent internal dialogue that enables us to examine accepted rules of conduct so that we won't be swept away unthinkingly by what everyone else does and believes in. Thinking results in conscience as, it by, as its byproduct and has a liberating effect on the faculty of judgment, the faculty of judging particulars, the ability to say, this is wrong, this is beautiful. What Arendt means by thinking is similar to what Fichte means by reflection. Both thinkers argue that there's an inner connection between a form of thoughtlessness and evil. Both thinkers conclude that moral goodness requires thoughtful or conscientious action. On Fichte's view, moral goodness also requires acquiring a sufficiently firm conviction before acting about what a particular situation demands. And if the convictions of others conflict with our own, we must communicate and seek to make our own judgment harmonize with that of the other. Ultimately, the necessary goal of all, all virtuous people, Fichte thinks, is unanimous agreement concerning the same practical conviction and concerning the uniformity of acting that ensues therefrom. Had Eichmann engaged in this form of thoughtful communicative action, had he engaged in this form of reciprocal interaction and conflict of minds, Perhaps he would have found it more difficult to accept that what he had once considered a crime, 
he now considered his duty. Instead, as Arendt noted, he accepted this new code of moral judgment as though it were nothing but another language rule. In the system of ethics, Fichte surmises that anyone who flees from the form of reciprocal interaction, whose aim is unanimous agreement concerning practical convictions, does so to avoid any disturbance of their own belief. In his own handwritten notes, Eichmann describes his distaste towards this sort of disturbance. Now that I look back, I realize that a life predicated on being obedient and taking orders is a very comfortable life indeed. Living in such a way reduces to a minimum one's need to think. Perhaps some of us will find it difficult to accept the providential framework that informs Victor's view that we should not lie, not even to an evildoer. But I hope my brief remarks on Arendt's analysis of Eichmann lend support to the Fichtian view that a form of thoughtlessness is at the root of evil. If we're confronted with evil, lying to prevent wrongdoing won't, on Fichte's view, get to the root of the difficulty. What we can do is model what reflective communicative action looks like and invite or summon the other to engage in this form of reciprocal interaction in conflict of minds. As Fichte says, even if a person is not now a tool of the moral law, I'm never permitted to give up hope that he will be able to become such a tool. This also holds in the case of my enemy. Having hope in the outcome of this conflict of minds is, I think, not only necessary to interact with our enemies, it also seems necessary to be good philosophers and good educators. Thank you.